good morning students so uh, today uh, i will be talking about another tissue nematode which is oncocerca valvulus so oncocerca valvulus is not common in india okay so uh, and it mainly causes blinding so it is also known as blinding filaria or river blindness i will come to that why it causes why it is called river blindness later so what is oncocerca valvulus this parasite oncocerca oncocerca itself means hooked tail so from the name itself you can tell they have hooked tails and now coming to the geographical distribution as i have already uh, said you that it is not common in india it is mainly found in africa central america and south arabia and habitat the adult worms they reside in the subcutaneous connective tissues in man now why these are called as river blindness the disease is called river blindness because it is transmitted by a black fly and this black fly they usually reside in the fast flowing streams and rivers mostly near remote rural villages okay so it is known as the river blindness and it causes blindness so river blindness this black fly that transmits the infection lives and breeds near fast flowing streams and rivers mostly near rural villages again the infection may result in visual impairment and sometimes blindness worldwide oncocerciasis is second only to trachoma as an infectious cause of blindness so now coming to morphology the adult worms they have cuticula which are raised in well marked annular and oblique thickenings well marked annular and oblique thickenings these are more prominent in females and the males are smaller than the females the males they measure about 3 cm in length by 0.13 mm in breadth and they have coiled tails and the females they are much longer than the males they are about 50 cm in length and 0.4 mm in breadth and these gravid females they may live up to 15 years they live in the subcutaneous connective tissues and they do not invade the muscles or the viscera they do not invade the muscles or the viscera now coming to microfilaria see these are also viviparous okay so they directly uh, lays the the females directly lay the larva that is the microfilaria this microfilaria they are found in skin and they are unsheeted till now whatever microfilaria we read were all sheeted remember there was a sheet in ucheria bancrofti in brugia also there was a sheet but this microfilaria they don't have a sheet they are unsheeted and they are non periodic and this nuclei column it is not present at the tail tip the nuclei column is not present at the tail tip so by now you already know the importance of uh, the tail tip and the head end and the tail end because it helps us to identify the uh, species they are about 300 micrometer in length by 6 to 8 micrometer in breadth see this is a picture of oncocerca valvulus they are not sheeted there is no sheet here and the tail end see the tail end they are devoid of any nuclei the tail end they are devoid of nuclei now coming to life cycle there is a definitive host and an intermediate host the definitive host is man and the intermediate host a day biting female black fly of the genus simulium of the genus simulium and this uh, black fly of the genus simulium they usually reside in they breed in fast flowing rivers and streams so hence the name 
river blindness. Okay. The developmental course in simulium is same as microfilaria bancrofti mosquitoes, but it is completed in 6 days. You see, it is very, the time period is very less here, only 6 days is required for the simulium to develop in the black fly. Mode of transmission of infection is bite of the infected female simulium, the infective larva, they remain mainly localized in the skin and grow into adult worms. The gravid females, they release the actively motile unsheeted microfilaria and they migrate in the skin, the subcutaneous tissues and eyes until they die or ingested by simulium. Okay, so they have a predilection for eyes. It is very important because it is a very important cause of blindness. So, what we see here, the uh, when the simulium bites, the infected simulium bites a human being, this larva, they remain localized in the skin and grow into adult worms. They do not invade the uh, bloodstream or they do not invade the organs. Okay, so they remain subcutaneous and they grow into adult worms. And uh, when they grow into adult worms, the male and female, they uh, the male fertilizes the female and the gravid female, they release unsheeted microfilaria. Now, this unsheeted microfilaria, they migrate in the skin and the subcutaneous tissues and eyes until they die or are ingested by simulium. That is, until they die or they are taken up by the simulium black fly again. So, the cycle is repeated. The incubation period in man is about one year. So, this is the life cycle. You can see first stage. This is the first stage. The black fly of the genus simulium takes a blood meal and along with the blood meal, the larva, it enters the simulium, uh, it enters the black fly. And uh, if an infected simulium bites a human being, then these infective larva are deposited on the skin of the human being and they grow subcutaneously. They grow in the subcutaneous tissues and they uh, transform into adult worms. First, they uh, grow in the subcutaneous tissues, then they form the adult worms in the subcutaneous nodules. Some uh, nodules are formed which are the you can say due to the uh, reaction between the host and the larva. There is some inflammatory reactions takes place and nodules are formed. These are subcutaneous nodules. So, you can find the adults in the subcutaneous nodules. These adults will then fertilize and then the females will lay the unsheeted microfilaria. These microfilaria are found in the skin and they migrate uh, in the skin and they may go to the eye. This uh, when the blood uh, black fly takes a blood meal again, then they again take up this microfilaria and the cycle is repeated. In the black in the black fly, the transformation is there in the midgut as it was in the Ucheria bancrofti. The same life cycle. Again, it continues in the black fly and thus the cycle continues. Now, coming to pathogenicity, the pathological changes in the skin and eyes result from a hypersensitivity reaction to the dead or dying microfilaria. And the disease caused by Oncosarca valvulus is known as Oncosarciasis. This is oncosarcasis. Now, this pathological lesions in oncosarcasis can be divided into two groups. One uh, due to the effect of the adult worms and again another one due to the effect of the microfilaria. So, what does the adult worm does? The adult worm, they form subcutaneous nodules. They form subcutaneous fibrous nodules and the microfilaria, they are responsible for the ocular lesions. So, First, let us talk about subcutaneous nodules. They will vary in size. 
that is they are not of uniform size some will be small some will be big so they are uh, they are not even they vary in size and they are very slow growing they are very slow growing and it may be single or multiple in a single human being you may find a single nodule or you may find multiple nodules even the distribution is uneven uh, sometimes it may be found in the lower limbs and also sometimes in the head area it actually depends upon the biting habit of the simulium if the uh, in certain areas the simulium they bites on the lower limbs so the nodules will be formed in the lower limbs and if the nodules uh, if they bite in the you know upper portion of our body like head or the uh, hands so the nodules will be formed there accordingly so uneven distribution and where does the nodules form these nodules occur in regions where the lymphatic coverage or where there is traumatic lymphatic obstruction on pressure points that is they uh, you will get these nodules mainly in on the uh, knees okay these knees are pressure points knees and also you get nodules on the um, like shoulders or on the head so simulium habits also explain the distribution as i have already told you now what are these nodules how are these formed these nodules are formed as a result of interaction between the parasite and the human host so uh, when this parasite enters our body, our human uh, host, they, uh, our uh, immunity is activated. As our immune, immune system is activated, so they, the immune system tries to kill the adult worms. As a result, there is inflammation. Okay. So, the nodules are formed as a result of this interaction between the parasites and the human host. These nodules are the graveyards of the adult worms. If you excise the nodule, if you excise the nodules and see, you may find uh, dead worms inside, dead adult worms inside. Okay, so these nodules represent the graveyard of the adult worms. They are raised above the skin surface. Obviously, these are nodules, so they will be raised above the skin surface, and they are painless. They are painless and non-suppurating. On section of these nodules, the concentric mass of fibrous tissue with a honeycomb central area containing the adult worm of both sexes are found intertwined. Okay. And these dead worms become calcified and initiate foreign body giant cell reaction. This is what I was talking about. See, uh, when the uh, worms die, as a result, it may be because uh, their lifespan has been completed or maybe due to the uh, immunity of our body, due to the immune response. When these dead worms die, they become calcified and this initiates a uh, foreign body giant cell reaction. As a result of this giant cell reaction, inflammation and calcification and everything, we find the formation of the nodules. Now, We also see along with the subcutaneous uh, nodules, we also find dermatitis which is associated with pruritis and it is caused by the toxins from the larva and the adult worms. When this larva and the adult worms, uh, they die or maybe some metabolites are released from their uh, body during uh, the, when the larva is released from the gravid females during the whole procedure. So, some toxins are released and these toxins they lead to pruritis and then dermatitis. There is redundant uh, wrinkling of the skin. The skin will be not even, it will be wrinkled. Skin becomes wrinkled and there are generalized papular rashes. And leopard skin, this term leopard skin, why it is known as leopard skin? Because there is uh, hyperpigmentation and depigmentation is seen. So, it seems like a leopard skin. So, hence the name leopard skin and there are also some lichenoid changes and hyperkeratosis. In blood examination, we may find high eosinophilia. Some uh, other complications are hydrocele and lymph scrotum, 
elephantiasis of scrotum and legs, hanging groin, these are few complications. Now let us come to ocular lesions, this is very important ocular lesions. So what is ocular onchocerciasis? It is particularly seen in person with nodules on head or face. When the nodules are on the head or on in the face, so you can understand the adult worm residing in the in this area. When these adult worms are residing in this area, so the microphylaria which are released by the gravid females, they can easily reach the eyes. From the lower limbs, it is very difficult to reach the eyes. They have to travel a very long path. Okay. So, it is particularly seen in person with nodules on head nodules on head or the face. They result from the presence of microphylaria found moving about in the substantia propria of the cornea, substantia propria of the cornea and in the anterior chamber. So where these microphylaria are found, they are found in the substantia propria of the cornea and in the anterior chamber. Now what are the clinical features resulting to this microphylaria being found in the substantia propria of the cornea and the anterior chambers? These are they will initiate conjunctivitis or small round opacities and panels in the anterior quadrant of the cornea which may later lead to formation of iridocyclitis, secondary glaucoma, papillitis, optic atrophy and eventually leading to blindness. So, how will we diagnose this? See, as we have uh, studied the previous two uh, parasites, Ucheria bancrofti and Brugia mellai, those were found in the blood because the microphylaria that was found in the peripheral circulation. So, by blood, uh, by examination of the blood, we could identify. But in this case, these are not found in the blood. As I have already said, they are found in the subcutaneous nodules in the skin. So, how do we uh, diagnose them? So obviously blood examination will not help. We have to what we have to do is we have to take a skin piece. Okay. We have to demonstrate the microphylaria in the shaped pieces of skin. The most common method of diagnosis is the skin snip, snip, skin snip. Uh, 1 to 2 mg shaving or biopsy of the skin is done to identify the larva. When this skin biopsy or this skin snip, these uh, scrapings, they are um, put in the normal saline, normal physiological saline, then this larva comes out and we can easily identify the larva. So, uh, 1 to 2 mg shaving or biopsy of the skin is done to identify larva which emerges from the skin snip and can be seen under a microscope when the shaving or biopsy is put in physiological solution example is normal saline. So when you put this uh, skin snip in a normal saline then this larva tends to come out and when this larva will come out we can identify them under microscope. Typically snip, uh, six snips are taken from different areas of the body. Next we can also demonstrate the adult worms. Okay, in the skin snip we are demonstrating the microphylaria. Now for the demonstration of the adult worm we can excise the nodules. What you will find? If we excise the nodules we will first find concentric layers of fibrous tissues and in the center there will be the adult worms both male and female intertwined. Now ocular lesions, ocular lesions this microphylaria is detected by slit lamp and in blood examination we will find high eosinophilia. There is another test this skin test or mazotis test. This is like a uh, allergic test, okay. appearance of pruritic papular rash is seen within 24 hours of an oral dose of DEC that is diethyl carbamazine. What is done? Diethyl carbamazine is given to the patient and after 24 hours we observe for pruritic papular rashes. Now what this DEC will do? DEC will 
obviously kill the macrophylaria and when this macrophylaria is killed they will initiate a they will release the toxins okay you remember they will release the toxins and when these toxins will be released then there will be pruritic papular rashes within 24 hours so appearance of pruritic papular rashes within 24 hours after an oral dose of 50 to 100 mg dec suggests the presence of cutaneous macrophylaria the reaction is caused by dead macrophylaria of oncocerca bulbulus killed by the drug fluorescent antibody technique elisa cft and pcrs are also developed but these are not much of practical value now coming to treatment these are also treated in the same way heterazine can be given there is one more drug suramine it is very you should use this uh, drug very judiciously because it causes uh, a lot of adverse effects and it is very toxic so suramine should be advocated very judiciously again ivermectin is there and enucleation of the nodules is advised it helps to reduce the danger of ocular complications and infection in anemic areas so we know the uh, adults they reside in the in these nodules so if we excise the nodules that is we are removing the adult worms it thus limits the uh, release of the microphylaria so enucleation of the nodule is advised prophylaxis is mainly directed against the insect host okay so this was all about oncocerca bulbulus now let us come to uh, another topic that is loa 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 the ge geographical distribution is central and west africa but in india also cases are found of loa loa Okay. Now this habitat, the adult worms are found in the subcutaneous tissues of man often in subconjunctival tissues of eye. So it is very important they also have a predilection for eyes and they are found in the subconjunctival tissues of eyes. Now coming to morphology, the adult worms here the cuticle are numerous rounded protuberances cuticular bosses they are known as cuticular bosses they are numerous rounded protuberances and they vary in number and arrangement of the two sexes this cuticula they vary in number and arrangement in both the sexes that is in male and female this uh, cuticula the numbers of the cuticula and the arrangements are different the males are 6 cm by 0.35 mm and the females are 6 centimeter by 0.5 mm so as usual the females are longer than the males and the lifespan is about 15 years or more now talking about the embryo or the microphylaria they are found in peripheral blood in daytime so they are found in the peripheral blood in oncosarca the microphylaria are not found in the peripheral blood but here they are found in the peripheral blood and at daytime and this uh, macrophylaria of loa loa is enveloped in a sheet so they have a sheet it's not like oncosarca these oncosarcas were unsheeted but loa loa they are sheeted so here the loa loa it is sheeted and the length is uh, the 300 micrometer by 7 micrometer and here you see the column of the nuclei they extend to the tail tip in oncosarca the tail tip did not have the nuclei column but here the column of nuclei it extends to the tail tip you see i hope you can appreciate this uh, till here it goes the sheet this is the sheet and the microphylaria it is still here and they have the nuclei up to the tail tip see the nuclei go to the tip of the tail and here is the sheet it is again a picture they have the sheet and this nuclei it extends up to the 
टिप ऑफ द टेल द बॉडी हैज इरेगुलर कार्ब एंड कैन टेक ऑन अ कॉर्क स्क्रू अपियरेंस द न्यूक्लियर इन द बॉडी आर कोर्स एंड क्राउडेड नाउ कमिंग टू लाइफ साइकिल दे हैव टू होस्ट मैन एंड क्राइसॉप्स क्राइसॉप्स आर मैंगो और दियर फ्लाइस द लर्वल डेवलपमेंट फॉलोज द सेम कोर्स एज इन अदर माइक्रोफेलेरिया एंड इट इज मेनटेन इन नेचर बाई इंटर ह्यूमन ट्रांसमिशन ट्रांसमिशन ऑफ इन्फेक्शन इज बाई डे बाइटिंग फीमेल क्राइसॉप्स Now see, this is the life cycle of Lua Lua. When these infected chrysops, they bite a human being. This L three lar um, larva, it enters the human body, and when it enters the human body, the adults they uh, are formed in the subcutaneous tissues. You see, they when the uh, chrysops they bite the uh, human skin, then these larvae are deposited under the skin, and here subcutaneously the adults grow into adult males and females. Now these adult males and females they will fertilize, and these gravid females they will produce sheeted macrophylaria, and this sheeted macrophylaria will then go to the circulation. Okay, and when these flies they again take up a blood meal, they will ingest this uh, microfilaria. Now this development of microfilaria it takes place in the chrysops, and finally it will become a uh, infected chrysops, and the life cycle will continue. Now talking about pathogenicity, disease in man is called loesis. Incubation period is average three to four years. It is a huge time period, three to four years. On entering the human host, the worm they migrate rapidly to various parts of the body through the subdermal connective tissues and shows a special predilection for creeping in and around the eyes. In and around the eyes, as I have told you, these adults they reside in the subcutaneous tissues. Okay, so. when uh, on entering the human host this uh, will transform into adult worms and this adult worms they will migrate to various parts of the body through the subdermal connective tissues and they will finally reach the eyes during mi migration it causes edema and subcutaneous tissues which is known as the calabar swelling or the fugitive swelling labor swelling or fugitive swelling what are this during migration it causes edema of the subcutaneous tissues and this edema of the subcutaneous tissues is known as the calabar swelling of the fugitive swelling microfilari can seldom be found during the period of calabar swelling that is during the first 4 years of the infection and the diagnosis is based on history of such fugitive swelling associated with intense eosinophilia during the first 4 years you see incubation period the incubation period itself is 3 to 4 years so within this first 3 to 4 years we cannot find microfilaria on blood examination so how will we diagnose loesis we can suspect loesis on the basis of if we see this calabar swelling or the fugitive swellings based on this history and we will also find intense eosinophilia so we can diagnose that the person is infected with loa loa again diagnosis methods are same as uh, ucheria bancrofti blood examination will reveal high eosinophilia and immunodiagnostic tests like cft and ifat elisa test are of limited values and pcr has also been developed so Uh, it is not as uh, oncosarca oncosarca what we did we took the skin snips but here blood examination can be done for diagnosis of loa loa as we get the microfilaria in the blood in the day time 
Now coming to treatment. Heterazine is an effective remedy for loesis. Uh, it causes quick disappearance of microfilary from the peripheral blood, but sometimes there may be violent allergic reactions due to administration of heterazine therapy. So, if there is violent allergic reactions, it should be elevated by antihistaminics and corticosteroids. Antihistaminics and corticosteroids. If the person has a very heavy load of uh, microfilaria in their body and the patient is given heterazine therapy, then it may cause violent allergic reactions. So, in patients where we suspect there may be a very heavy load of microfilaria in their circulation, we have to also give antihistaminics or corticosteroids. Development of meningoencephalitis and nephrotic syndrome are seen in cases harboring a large number of microfilaria and when treated with DEC in a dose of 5 to 10 mg per kg per day. So, these are the complications meningoencephalitis and nephrotic syndromes. So, uh, why these uh, complications arise? It is mainly due to the toxic products that are released from the death of the worms. So, it should be treated very cautiously under corticosteroid cover and ivermectin is used effectively. Now, prophylaxis, personal protection from the bites of infected flies in an endemic area and destruction of chrysops. Now, some important points to remember. What about the adult worms? Okay. See, if you see the adult worms, they have the cuticula. In some cases, the cuticula is smooth and some the cuticula is not smooth. So, we will find smooth cuticula in Ucheria bancrofti and Brugia mali. And cuticula is not smooth in case of Loa Loa and Oncosarca valvulus. In Loa Loa, the cuticula is provided with minute warts and Oncosarca valvulus, it is provided with annular and oblique thickenings. So, we can differentiate the adult worms can be differentiated easily on the basis of the cuticula. Now, which are found in blood? See, Ucheria bancrofti, Brugia mali, and Loa Loa. These microfilarias of these are found in blood and in skin, the microfilaria of Oncosarca volvulus. Now, which are sheeted? Sheeted are microfilaria of Ucheria bancrofti, Brugia mali, and Loa Loa. And unsheeted is microfilaria of Oncosarca volvulus. Now, nuclei up to tail tip. Nuclei up to tail tip we find in Brugia mali and Loa Loa. And tail tip is free from nuclei, it is seen in Oncosarca volvulus. You can see here the tail tip. Again, the tail tip here. So, what it will be? The first one. The first one will be Ucheria bancrofti. Then, the second one. There are terminal and subterminal, terminal and subterminal nuclei. So, this will be Brugia mali. Now, this it is sheeted, but nuclei extends to the tail tip, it is loa loa. And here, number 4, it is not sheeted, it will be, and the tail tip is free from any nuclei. So, it will be Oncosarca volvulus. So, you see. Easily by looking at the tail tip, we can differentiate these four parasites. I hope it is clear. Now, from your examination point of view, uh, these uh, two, they both affect the eyes. So, it is a very important point to remember. You may get questions, those parasites which affects our eyes. These are Oncosarca valvulus and Loa Loa and you may be asked viva questions on this. You should know what is calabar swelling or the fugitive swelling.
and you should know loa loa thoroughly okay so that's all for today thank you